Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 87. This episode is Blake Collins, who is an ADR and Foley mixer, uh, which is just fascinating. Like, you guys know I'm all about the process uh, and when it comes to literally anything, but also movies. And it was really, really cool to hear uh, the part from the sound department and where in post-production he works and how that stuff comes in, how it's created. He, go- he goes really in-depth to what exactly this job entails. Um, different sound effects, different ways that they captured those sounds. Uh, I got to find out kind of how they uh, how they get the stuff in the Foley room, because that's something I've always wondered. Uh, it was great. It was great. Blake was really, really cool. Um, had some great stories. We talked about the different projects that he's on. Um, we talk about um, just how exactly this all works, because that's something I've always been interested in, is where exactly in the pipeline of the post-production process does this stuff happen, you know? And uh, Blake's just the coolest, the coolest. Um, so I learned a lot, and I love learning about new things. And uh, well, you guys are going to understand what a uh, Foley and ADR mixing is after this, which is super exciting. So uh, without further ado, here is the interesting podcast, episode number 87 with Blake Collins. Theme song time. <laughs> your day good uh we finished the show or not finished the show we we finished our day at, at five and um That's had a, a late yeah i had a late loop group session last night after a foley session uh so you know lots of setup and tear down for real quick and sure uh yeah it wasn't it wasn't too bad though there you it go. was a nice light day light days are always good i've uh yeah. I've, you know 12 to 16 hour days on set are not unheard of so uh-huh. when you can yep. when you can wrap on time, that's uh, you're doing well. You're doing well. Yeah, Foley. Uh, generally, there, there's hardly ever that we're asked to to stay late because it is such a a beast of a, a thing to to schedule and to to do. And that you know the Foley artists are working eight hours and they're moving and lifting and walking and crushing and doing whatever. And yeah, to have stage time plus two Foley artists plus a mixer, it's just like the overtime just goes through the roof. Oh, uh, if and when that does happen, but yeah, so it doesn't happen too often. So it's kind of nice. Yeah, sure. I, you know what? This is the first time I've I've realized that a fully artist and a fully mixer, two different people. Look what I've learned yeah. today. Yeah, I mean, the, you can kind of do. It's very hard to do single personally. I bet if that's the correct English. Sure, um, it is now. But you know, with with <laughs> technology, you can grab an iPad and you got your transport controls there, and so if you have to, you can. But it's it's usually a lot better to have a couple heads working on on one sound at the same time, and you know it's a, a team effort, so it's uh, usually get a better product that way. Yeah, I think so too. Any any pretty much anything that's team involved sure. is is always going to be better. You got right. more people, more creative in, in things going on. That's why I think uh-huh. like movies. I think movies are like the most collaborative art form there is. Yeah, so many people. I mean, you could just so be good. sitting there racking your brain on something, and like just totally not getting it, and then your partner will say something. You're like, "Oh, that's it. I got it. We're exactly. done." Exactly. Because they, they got a different vantage point. They're like, "Oh, it's, yeah, for just sure. Turn it. You know. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. If, if only it was that simple as uh, just turn it, yeah. and then <laughs> we got it. <laughs> If you write a book, I give you permission to use that as the title. Great. Thank you. You, you know, whatever. Nice. It could be about anything. You know, uh-huh. <laughs> this I'm is. Gonna start, I'm gonna start using that. I say, hey, just turn it. Just turn it. You know, and <laughs> and people can put their own thing on it. Be like, oh, just turn it, and then you give it to like ten different people, and it all means something different. Right. This, this is a service I provide, Blake. So um, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, my pleasure. My pleasure. Just turn it. <laughs> That's our life's motto, starting right now. <laughs> so you're you're in California. I'm in California. I'm in the Bay Area. Yeah. Right. Um, Where the magic skywalk. happens. Right. Skywalker's up in, in Marin County. Love so uh, half an hour above San Francisco. Right on. Are you from there? Uh, I'm from a town called Paradise, California. Oh, which, that's uh, outside of uh, 
Um, the one that just burned down last, last November. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Cool. Used to be the one. Yeah, um, cool, man. So I'm from there. Um, and then uh, I started my career in L.A., was there for about nine years, and then got the got the big call. Yeah, for real, man. <laughs> to come up to Star Wars land. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. You know, just it's a that's a Thursday. You know, <laughs> that, no that's my Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> so was was doing sound like when did you want to get into movies then? Because me, I feel like a lot of people I've talked to that grew up around L.A. because movies are such a big thing there. It's hard not to be inspired to get into that kind of thing. Was that the yeah. same for you or? Not exactly. I want. I, I growing up in Paradise, we're you know eight nine hours from L.A. Sure. Um, I wanted to do music, so uh-huh. I went to like the local state. I went to Chico State for a couple of years and tried to get into their music industry program and and do that. And I wanted my whole deal is like I want to go to Seattle and work at Tooth and Nail Records and Love it. and record bands and be a producer and stuff. And then, um, you know, I got a little discouraged at school, just class sizes, learning signal flow with like 300 kids in an auditorium was a little, little too much Fair. to like grasp when I had no knowledge of it. Yeah. Uh, so I did two years there and just kind of didn't care for it. I took a year off and then I decided to go to a, a vocational audio school in Arizona. Sweet. Um, and yeah, it was a year long program and we learned, I was still planning on doing music. Uh, we learned everything, uh, recording wise, signal flow, mixing, plugins, all that kind of stuff. And it was great, sure. and there, um, there happened to be like halfway through like a post production uh, course that was part of our curriculum, and then I kind of just fell in love with like sound effects and and movies, and I'm like, oh, this is this is not what everybody's doing at this school. So maybe if I try this route, I can, you know, excel and succeed this route, Smart. and not have the amount of competition that I would uh, graduating with everybody else. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> And so I did that, and I loved it, and that kind of just changed everything as far as, like, didn't want to go to Seattle because there's no post-production in <laughs> Seattle. You know, everything is based in, L- like, L.A. and Burbank areas, like, the more or less the post-production capital of the world. So, yeah, um, yeah I just I found studios, I, I, like Warner Brothers, Sony, all that kind of stuff. Those were my tops, and, of course, I didn't get any of those for the, uh, the internship program mm-hmm. uh, part of the schooling, but... Um, that's okay. It worked out. No, for sure. (laughs) (laughs) For, um, for, when was it? January of 2008, like right after New Year's, I moved down to my uncle's, uh, in Arcadia, which is in Florida. No, no, no. (laughs) In, uh, in Southern California. It's maybe an hour from Los Angeles. Okay. Depending on traffic. Um, so I moved down there like on a Friday. I think on a Saturday, I got a call from my internship coordinator. And she said, hey, I got this place called Dubbing Brothers USA oh. uh, in Burbank that needs an intern. Do you want it? I was like, well, I don't know what that is, so <laughs> let me call it back. Sure. So I was like, I don't want that. Like, what, what is Dubbing Brothers? Um, so I, I, I looked it up, and uh, it was an international – they're an international company, so they're based out of France. They do a lot of foreign dubbing, a lot of foreign movies into English, and then – Overseas, they did a lot of English movie dubs into uh, the whatever domestic language they were in. So French and German, Italian, all that kind of stuff all over the world. Sure. And I looked at it. I was like, well, I'd heard stories of people like not getting, obviously, their first choice internships. But then like because of time, like they just weren't getting, uh, finding a place. So they ended up doing their internship at Guitar Center. And I was like, right. I do not want that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, so I called my internship coordinator back the next day. I was like, hey, yeah, let's do it. Let's let's make this happen. And, you know, it was the best thing that could have ever happened. Yeah. Um, my 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 boss for the internship was great. His name is Fred Tayeb. Um, he I think my first day he's like, hey, this is not going to be the internship where you're getting coffee and taking out the trash. You're going to like learn stuff. Hey. And we, well, dude, I was setting up sessions for him and getting stuff ready for mixes and I learned ADR and was doing some of those and Dude. doing spotting sessions and prep session uh, session preps for for the engineer there and um, I did my internship for two months and then they hired me so that was awesome Dude. Um, and and they're in this big building in kind of the heart of Burbank and in that building there was a few other studios and through that internship and that building 
and the time that I was there, I mean, that's how I've met all of my contacts for everyone I've ever worked for. Right. Um, and that's, I met the, the one step up guys. That's where I started learning fully from them. Beautiful. Uh, I did ADR at W brother. I did ADR for the dub stage and, uh, you know, just every connection that I made there, it was just, it was the right, perfect place for me. Yeah. So when you're doing something like that, like people have always said, you know, like the, a dream job is still a job. So like if you're going to school for all this mixing and stuff and then you get an internship that is on the job training, but like for real this time, as opposed to like uh -huh. you're saying, like coffee, what was something that like when you started the internship that you're like, oh, this is different than what I learned in school? Was there anything like that? Yeah. Learn in school kind of like the basics, like, hey. In a perfect world, this is how everything's going to work. Right. And then you get into the throw of things where maybe something's not wired correctly or things aren't oh, yeah. as they seem. Or you just get in, in school to job, like you learn the basics in a job, but then everything, every other possibility can happen, whether yeah. you have finicky, trebly clients or just like something doesn't work that day or the printer's out of ink, so you can't print your script. So, you, you know, there's oh. X, Y, and Z, everything. You never would you learn the basics of, like, say, Pro Tools, which is the, the audio program that I used to do all the recording. It's the kind of the standard in post-production. Even still. And, and you learn how to turn your mic on and, and all that kind of stuff in school. And, yeah, you do, you do projects and samples and stuff in school. But, you know, it seems like there, it, every day is not the same. Like at my, my Loop Group ADR session last night, um, you know, the guide tracks that we were working with, like the, the temp dialogue and effects and music and that kind of stuff. Sure. Was just like way quieter. It was a way quieter of a of a guy track than normal. So I'm playing this nine minute short to a room full of loop group actors, so they can kind of get the feel for the thing, but they can't hear anything. And it's like the same uh... session of things that I do every day. And I'm like, well, what the heck? Everything, all of my stuff looks normal. Yeah. <laughs> and working twenty minutes ago, so there's just things that are different. Like people don't in you know, there's not like a, a super standardized um, standard of w the way that something will be sent to me each time or whatever. So, you know, you just kind of have to know your stuff and you kind of have to just make sure that everything's the way you need it and you can't just ever rely on, oh, I'm, the other person knows what they're doing, so what they give me is going to work for how sure. I need it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's always just double checking and, you know, people just do stuff differently, so it's just double, triple checking what's um, what I need and, and all that kind of stuff. Right. I'm sure there's a lot of problem solving as well for any sort of technical uh, job yeah, like that. I'm, you're working like on a Foley stage, which is primarily what I do. Amazing. Uh, I'm in a, in, in a separate room than my Foley artists. And so like the sound I have to send to them if they're wearing headphones or over the speaker um, there's so many just different stages of where things are being sent and routed and all that kind of stuff. And what, what they're hearing as they perform in the room with what my microphone picks up with the effects that I'm adding, like oh, there's any number right. of times that we're all hearing something different at the same time. So the way they think something's working based on what I think it sounds like. And then when I pull up, you know, the track with it, how it's working with all the other sounds that are in there, um, there's just always a stop and check. And hey, let's reanalyze for making sure this is actually working. Like it could sound good on its own, but when you add music, you know, it could totally take up the the low end of that sound. And um, uh, it just we might have to adjust uh, for that kind of thing, or the sound effects of something that's going on sure. uh, might interfering with the sound that we're trying to get. So you know, it's just always checking with everything all the time, just to make sure that, like what we're doing is cutting. And it's not interfering with something or making something else sound funky or weird or doubling up with production or any of that kind of stuff. Man, that is fascinating. Any Anything with Foley and, like, sound mixing and stuff has always been – I mean, it's half of what you're experiencing. you got the visuals and then you have the audio. And the audio okay. makes or breaks a movie. And uh, whew, yeah. that's so cool to hear you about can have, You can have, like, a, a, a film that was super low budget that um, – you know, say they, they recorded like on VHS and you can kind of get into that visually because it's a feel and stuff. But if you have like audio, you can't understand. True. I mean, you're, no matter how good or how bad your picture looks, you're, ne you're not going to understand it based totally on what right. it, it looks. 
if you have bad audio, it, it, I mean, I'm, I'm somewhat biased, but yeah. <laughs> if you have bad audio, it's just distracting. It's going to take you out. I agree. Um, it's, uh, to me, it's it's 50% of the, the film I going agree. experience. I might even say, I'll, I'll be generous. Let's say 60. Let's give you a little, let's give you a little bump here. Yeah, goes, you know? yeah, I mean, yeah, you got Atmos let's, and let's do it. now. <laughs> yeah. There's so much more audio than visual because you got one-sided visual and then you're surrounded and That's feel true. that. The, come on. Boom. You're right. 75. 75. I give it to yeah. you. Here's a stamp. We did it. 75% <laughs> sound. It is true because if you've got like, because a, a lot of people are, that I've talked to, um, like in real life, they're like, hey, just, you know, you want to film some stuff, just like take your phone out. I'm like, okay, cool. I understand the idea of what you're saying, mm -hmm. but from a production value thing, like the video is one thing, but if if you have like, like you're saying, if you have like a less than great visual, really good audio, that's way more easier to digest than the opposite. Right. You know, if you, you have like of, terrible audio. The filmmaker was wanting to go with like a, a low quality type of, not low quality, but a, a lower resolution or like a grainy or like an old, old school vibe. Exactly. Feel to the picture. And in and, and audio, we can, we can match that audio wise, but then it's an effect and not like cutting out dialogue or, or, or sound that was recorded too hot or distorted or, or whatever. It's, exactly. Um, yeah. It's so cool, man. So <laughs> like, do you know where they get the, so like, Describe this to me. I'm gonna correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, this is just what I know, having seen behind the scenes things. So as an amateur, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> so there's you, the mixer, mm -hmm. is in like a booth. Yep. And then the foley artists are in their own sort of booth where they have right. all the like props and things. Yeah. So there's me in my room, and my room set up. Um, it's it's a five one room. I don't ever record in five one for Foley, but it's so I can check if there's five one stems of, of effects and music and backgrounds and all that stuff that I can make sure it's really fitting in. Mm -hmm. um, then I have all my gear and my my reverbs and my processing and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, like a traditional like ADR stage or something, I got a glass window that's shooting it or that's looking into a um, a Foley stage and a Foley stage kind of can look like your garage where there's just boxes of uh, of things stacked up high Sweet. with uh, like a whole bunch of different surfaces on the ground, like dirt and rock and cement and uh, wood. And um, so that's, I guess, not like most people's garages, but um, <laughs> there's a whole bunch know. of different <laughs> because we're, we're, we're rewalking every character on screen with whatever shoe and whatever surface they're on because we're re-adding in all of that sound. Right. Um, so we just kind of need every kind of surface and, and thing available to to recreate whatever we're seeing on screen. Man, so none of the audio that is on set is in the final product? Uh not necessarily. Um okay. on set, most of the time they're recording uh sound just for dialogue. That's their main kind of focus and mm -hmm. um whatever hard effects or production effects live within that dialogue track like if say somebody's walking or somebody's fighting or slamming something down as dialogue's going on mm -hmm. um or when when sound is rolling we we will use that if we can because it kind of gives a um like a natural feel or it really is what's grounding things on the picture to what we're hearing so we can use oh, that to our advantage right. and then like match those footsteps with what we have so they both can play nicely together or so we can extend what's on production um, and then and then put it to the rest of the film. Like, so if somebody's walking off screen, we maybe don't have those footsteps. We still want to hear them, or um, maybe they're um, yeah. There's just all sorts of different uh, things we can do or use. But yeah, a lot of production you can hear. But then for like foreign versions of a film, mm -hmm. um, say like uh, the newest Avengers came out. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> <laughs> It did, and it came out very good. Yeah. <laughs> um, all of that dialogue in those movies in your in your major territories um, that's going to be dubbed in French, it's going to be dubbed in Spanish and German and Russian and all that kind of stuff. So when you take ah. out the domestic language, in our case English, all of everything that was could, um, everything that was tied to dialogue, if there was any footsteps or body falls or any kind of sound effects that were recorded on set, that's going to get taken out as well. So that's where Foley comes in. So we will fully cover a, a picture top to bottom with the footsteps and the movements or cloth sounds and then all the sound effects that go with that. 
so when those foreign versions happen, they're not going to be missing anything uh, in their territories. Um, so sure. there won't be any holes, and there won't be there won't be like an unfinished track when they when they see it in their theater. So that's right. a big part of what full is. We do a lot of foreign uh, M&Es, which is music and effects. There's a whole separate track and a separate pass of, of that kind of stuff. Oh, man. So do you know where they get the props for those rooms? Do they just find e- them? Everywhere. Really? Um, oh, yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of times they'll go shopping for, for things. Oh, I love but it. But it's uh, just a big collection over, like, one of the Foley artists I work with has been doing this for 25 or so years. So she has just a, a collection of things. And then when we need something specifically, um, we'll either find it or we'll make it or we'll go out and buy it. Like I just did, we weren't happy with the wood surface that we had, and we just worked on a, a movie that was like this murder mystery in a in a mansion type thing. So we needed some good sounding wood floors. So mm-hmm. we have this one wooden built in in our in our stage that we aren't super happy with. So I just I bought three different types of hardwoods, uh, flooring from you know your big box retailer, and then I built three frames that were slightly different, and then I. Uh, installed those wood flooring, like the tongue and groove uh, pieces of wood together and made three portable wood surfaces that we can then put on other surfaces to make sound super janky or put them on our built-in wood floor to just give it a bunch of depth and a bunch of bottom end or sometimes we'll put it on grass or cement or put a blanket over it so we have like a hard nondescript thing. So we, you know, we make stuff, we buy stuff, we find stuff, we what? break stuff so it works different. It's it's crazy. It's Dude. fun. That's what you do for a living. How cool like, is that? <laughs> yeah. No, it's 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 a uh, it's a trip. Now to see where I am and to see who I'm working with. Right. Um, see where then, you're no, working. <laughs> and just yeah, to see what, dude. I don't know if you've ever seen. I don't know if there's many pictures of this place, but it's like a thousand acre working ranch. Dude. It's in. It's. I mean, there's cow. There's goats and there's turkeys and you know all kinds of stuff. And then in the middle of all that, there's this huge building where we're making sounds for all the everything everything dude yeah oh i've seen fanboys <laughs> <laughs> yep it's uh yeah i know it's it's a great place to work and the the amount of talent in this building is um that's the thing it's, that, that's yeah, the thing it's, i've learned it, the best of the best are making the best of the best yourself included and oh, well, thank you. i just i i love hearing about that cuz like i mean half of this show I started it was because there's so much that people don't know about. And I was like, I want to learn all about it and talk to those people. Yeah. I love mm-hmm. that it's like, you know, you just went and bought wood because you needed the right wood sound. That's so cool yeah. for anyone no, that's into behind the scenes stuff, you know? It's a lot of fun. And, you know, like as I'm just out about doing errands or whatever, uh, my wife's always stopping me. She's like, you know, you're just standing like listening to something like <laughs> if we're shopping for clothes, I'll listen to a shirt to see how it rustles against itself yes. to see if it'll be good for like a cloth pass. I was going to ask if you're a really good listener now. <laughs> I, unfortunately, like, dude, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm so good at listening. Maybe not to the person who's in front of me, but like if I'm sitting <laughs> having lunch, I'm listening to every conversation around me <laughs> just to see if it's interesting. It's, uh, yeah, it's probably oh bad. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> You're like I'm an I'm an uh, what is it omnidirectional listener? Yeah. You just post up and you're like, okay, oh, yeah. here we are. I'll, I'll catch like, if I'm having lunch with my partners or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'll uh, I'll catch them just staring at me because I've zoned out and I'm listening to the table next to me or whatever. And yeah. <laughs> if anybody ever hears this, they'll uh, they'll be like, oh, I guess we got to talk quieter if Blake's around. <laughs> right. And if they get mad, then you'd be like, it's research, and then just <laughs> keep eating. <laughs> oh my god! Because I've heard of like Matt Wood carries like a recorder around. He goes, that's a cool sound. And it's oh, like, yeah, I mean, back. so many people do that. Like, I'll do it now, like, if we go on vacation or we're going somewhere that I haven't been to, like, you can collect just background ambiences of things or, or whatever. And, you know, Matt Wood and, and those kind of guys are sound designers where are, are really looking for those things all the time. Yeah. Um, they kind of have their tools. Where mine is we create kind of in a confined space where we have all of our tools around us. Um, but sure. we're on the lookout for how things sound so we can bring them back to our stage. Do you have a favorite sound? I like oh, asking, man. I like asking the hard questions. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know that I have. Oh, you know what? I do have a favorite sound. Oh, sweet. So on, on, oh, what's the street? I haven't lived in Los Angeles now for a few years, mm-hmm. but there was, I think it's Victory Boulevard. I like it. In, in Burbank. Uh, I walked to work one day for some reason, 
So I don't know. It's probably between. It's between uh, Lancashire and let's say Burbank Boulevard. I know where Lancashire there's these, is. <laughs> there's these. How are, are you? Are you based in L? No, you're based in Florida. I'm in Florida, but I've been to LA and I know exactly okay. where Lancashire is. Gotcha. Um, there's these power lines and I walked under them and it just has like this like Ooh. static electric. It was just like, you know, almost kind of like a cicada or, or, you know, like those weird, like cone football shaped magnet things that you can like spin together and they kind of have like this marbly yes. glassy. It kind of sounds like that, but like a more fluid thing. That's what? probably one of my favorite sounds just walking. And it's probably most power lines sound like that, but <laughs> those are the ones that are noticeable. But, um, I think my favorite sound effect right now uh, for the last couple of years, or it was actually, it was Foley, um, was in The Last Jedi. I love it. When Kylo is in the, in Snoke's like chamber, red room or whatever, and he pick he picks up his own lightsaber from the ground. Yes. And it's just like kind of deep, unctuous is not the right word, but that's the word I, I like, like to it use is. to describe it. <laughs> And, you know, it's kind of like the scrape up, but it's got the weight. Oh, it's just, it's a satisfying sound for for that. And that's one of my favorites. That might be weird, but. That's a great that's, one. That's it. I, and, yeah. See, you're way better at describing things than me. Because I'd be like, okay, they're power lines that, like, if you touched it, you know you're going to die. That oh, sound. Sure. <laughs> like, that, yep. that, it's one of those, like, it's a live power line, and you know that. <laughs> yeah. I like, you're, you're way better. You're like, cicadas. You know, like, you know, like, oh, wow, yeah, you're right. You're right. I mean, I'm like, you die if you touch it. That's what it sounds uh-huh. like. It's one of those. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> see. Man, that's cool. That's real. So, like, when you, what would you say, because, like you said, there's a lot of, like, you never really know each day is different because you're working on different things. Right. But, like, I, you know, hold on. Go back. What is a loop group? I've heard that okay, mentioned so a bunch of times. Loop group. So, um, loop group is going to be a group of people, usually split male and female, um, different, uh, oh, it depends on the, on the show or whatever, but usually try to get different ethnicities or backgrounds in there. So we have quite a, a smattering of selection Sure. and they're going to be the group that does like crowd scenes or, um, they'll be called in last night. We had to do like baseball announcers for some radio that was going to be in the background somewhere. So the two of the guys came up and just read like a three minute script of just baseball game highlights. Oh, sweet. And when um, there's big crowd scenes and the dinosaurs are eating somebody, they're the people that are screaming. So, like, all that kind of stuff. Oh. Any any large crowds, any, like, at a party when there's just murmur and chattering and it's called a, a walla. Um, yes. Just I've unintelligible heard. dialogue, I guess, is a big part of it. And then the screaming or cheering and laughing. Uh, anything that requires, like, a big crowd. Um, or just like couples talking over there, because a lot of like background actors and stuff who would have those roles, right? Their their contacts are just for picture non speaking roles only. Yep. Been so there. <laughs> they can't use their voices for anything. So if they did talk or if they didn't, well, everything gets replaced. So uh, loop groups will do that kind of stuff. Um, so crowds, baseball game, concerts, cheering, all that kind of all that kind of stuff, or like shout outs for that you hear. Um, uh, like off the off screen where someone says run it's a dinosaur or whatever oh uh, right right dinosaurs. that was what I was working on last night yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah so just like stuff like that that's that's what Walla is and Loop Group is the the term used for those people okay because I've wondered yeah. that for a while and I've heard it mentioned in circles as well it's like oh the Loop Group did this I'm like okay what is that now I know yeah, it's, a, it's background it's a big audio ADR scene. Or ah. dialogue recordings. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is there yeah. is there a different way to approach like because I know you've done ADR as well as Foley mixing. Is mm-hmm. there is there is that two different things when it comes to your side of it? Um, not really. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, idea is the same, and I mean I still use all the same uh, programs and microphones, all that kind of stuff. So it's really the same. That's kind of how I got into it. Like I, I met the guys at One Step Up when I was doing ADR for Dubbing Brothers. And I just kind of sat in with them uh, and just became friends with them. Every now and then they'd have me do a, a few cues with them if they were doing group uh, cues. Like, um, so it would be the opposite of Walla where we're doing lots of people clapping or lots of people walking. Those are like group um, sound effect cues or Foley cues or whatever. So I would just kind of happen to help out every now and then. So 
Um, there, in 2011, they were leaving the W Brothers building and moving over to the Fox lot. Mm-hmm. And so I just sat with them. I said, hey, if you guys ever need, like, you know, another mixer or whatever, um, I'd be happy to help. And two months later, they called and said, hey, you, we'd love to take you up on that offer because you've done ADR. And basically, the the idea behind everything is the same. Right. Um, you get the, the logistics of it all. And now it's just like training your ear to, will be, to be for sound effects instead of voice. So it translates pretty well. Foley's pretty specific um, with what, because you have to be uh, mindful of what's going to work with um, with production, with music, with effects, with all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's it's something that's trainable to learn. Sure. As far as mixing. So when, at what point in the pipeline are you guys at? Like, is there music and sound effects and stuff yet? Or you're just getting, like... It, it really depends on the show. Really? And how far along. So, let's see. We're doing... We're working on a show called... Uh, I don't know what I'm allowed to say or what I'm not allowed yeah. to say. So <laughs> What stuff the show, have you worked on in the past? Show, right. Okay. So, what I'll did we just out. finish? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so Captain Marvel. Yes. We worked on Captain Marvel. That came out a Love few it. months ago. Um, so, VFX are very rough when we were working on that. So visuals, uh, like suits and, and weapons and ships and all that kind of stuff. A lot of it's a lot of just green screen or there's just not a lot of final stuff. And so we have not even final, like Marvel's a funny, a funny thing. Cause they'll, they'll work and work their thing and do ADR over and over and over and really craft their thing. Even once a lot of the sounds done or once a lot of the principal shooting is done, um, so that we had, we had some temp music, we had some real music, a lot of the sound effects are just like in progress or like what the guy on, uh, the avid cut, like the picture editors are throwing in sound effects to kind of help tell their story through picture with, you know, temp, uh, sound effect beats and that kind of stuff. Right. Um, so it's really, it's really just different. So sometimes really rough, sometimes it's really polished. Um, it's kind of just a mixed bag every time. Gotcha. Okay. That's pretty cool. So depending on the yeah. production, depends on it's like the pipeline is the pipeline. There's gonna yeah. there's interchangeable steps as to I guess the director's preference. So right, when, yeah. do you have show, like the show, go ahead. do you have like the director and the people there with you when you're doing this stuff? You know, sometimes we do. Um, a lot of times, at least a lot of first time like first time directors aren't super familiar with what Foley is, so they'll want to come down and see and maybe sit for a day. Sure. But most of the time, we're just kind of left alone. Really, um, it's a testament well, to you guys. Yeah, yeah. no, that's <laughs> it's true. It's it's usually like when post sounds going on. There's just so many things to do right. that, like you know, the director is um, is doing. They got a thousand things they're doing. They're working on color. They're working on editing. They're working on sound. They're working on marketing and all that kind of stuff. So there's not so much time where there's ever free time to have just like days to sit in. Like we were just working on like the the angry bird sequel and the director was here for two days uh and he sat with us for maybe a half an hour uh <laughs> and then he's just got to go because he's got to check sound effects he's got to check bgs he's got to check music and he, there there's just so much going on in a film post-production all at the same time because it is one of the last things that happen sure that all things have to happen at the same time so they can't just dedicate and you know their time is more um more valuable because for them sitting in it's not like they have the experience with it they might be able to tell us the sound kind of wanting to hear but since we're covering such a breadth of stuff like if they focus on every sound or try to help out with everything it would just kind of slow everything down so they kind of eh, just leave everything to us to do and then there's usually a check at the end like where they listen back to everything and say hey let's actually make that like more beefy or slappy or whatever um and that's when we'll kind of get some notes but most of the time the sound supervisors uh, we'll kind of know the vision of the director. So we're dealing with um, our sound supervisors and uh, we check in with sound effects at editors and stuff and make sure we're all kind of not stepping on anybody's toes and complimenting each other and, and that kind of stuff. Sure. That's yeah. amazing. I love yeah, it. It's, just it's proves, a lot of fun. Proves what I said before. It's just the best of the best, man. It, it, the yeah. fact that like uh, somebody in charge of somebody, that, somebody in charge of a project that has that much money behind it you know, these big blockbusters, and it's like, you know, they let you to your own devices is a huge testament. The fact that they're not like, mm, yeah. hold on, let me, that footstep's <laughs> wrong, you know? 
but that's yeah, I mean, and there cool. there are some that get into the, the nitty nitty gritty. Well, they'll play every sound naked and be like, nope, 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 or really? yep, yep, <laughs> yep. Uh, it's like Kubrick Fincher, stuff. <laughs> Fincher is notorious for 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 just making sure every single thing in his his films and his shows that he just love he has to love every everything and he doesn't anything that's to his standards he doesn't let go which is it's good because then he gets like the best out of everyone right um but it can get it can get nitty gritty sometimes i bet well it's like you know stanley kubrick and his like 75 takes that's like yeah and <laughs> like, then there's okay. people like when who does like two max right whatever. can you imagine That'd be nice. Yeah, but I mean, he's just expecting the best out of his actors and to know what they're supposed to be doing at that time and to he make sure they're prepared. And he's not going to second guess that, like, hey, if I do this 10 more times, that he's going to get something better. He's, I think he's he's just hiring the best, and, and that he's got that kind of mindset where, hey, their first one or two are going to be the best of what they got or something like that. Yeah, you're right. And it's not like the actors can be like, yeah, well, you're not an actor. Well, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You don't understand, and then you just get that Gran Torino ugh, look, and you're like, okay, you're, you're right. Sorry, sorry, yeah, you're sorry. right. Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, yep. Man, and then you've got the other side that's like the Coen brothers who don't ever give yeah. any direction, and it's like if they say we're moving on, that's the highest compliment you can get because like, yeah. all right, we got it. I worked uh, on a, a show for them. Oh, uh, I know. On, on Buster Scruggs, we did some mm. some ADR with Tom Waits, and that was a an interesting Dude, uh, ADR session. Talk to me. That's how he talks uh, in real uh, life. I've heard, you know, <laughs> and that's oh, yeah, that's I mean, the he, best one out of the Buster Scruggs one. Yeah, no, it was, it was a lot of fun. Like when I saw, I had knew nothing about it when I when I first started, but when I saw that, I was like, oh, I gotta watch this thing. Right. Um, but yeah, like uh, I and I'm gonna get them confused. I think Ethan <laughs> was in here with me, and then Joel was out there uh, on the stage with Tom. And oh. <laughs> there was just one thing uh, we're trying to do this cue, and Joel's in there walking around. He's playing with change in his pocket <laughs> while like Tom's trying to record dialogue. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, this is all great, but there's like change. I was telling his brother, I was like, I think he's playing with like change in his pocket, and he said to his brother, he's like, Joel. Can't play a change in your pocket or something like that. Was, <laughs> that <was> Stop. <laughs> yep. That's amazing. I was I was talking with Jonathan Davis recently and uh-huh. he talked about doing audiobooks and the mics are so good that like you can hear them breathe sometimes. Okay, like, I'm so as they're just there. <laughs> I'm super like conscious right now about how much I'm breathing into this <laughs> microphone because I'm using <laughs> one of those microphones that I would do for an audiobook or for ADR or whatever. Yeah. And like I'm wearing headphones. I'm like, oh, I can hear myself breathing. I hope this is not going <laughs> to. Thanks. So let me know if I get about. too close because I'm usually never on this side of the microphone. No, you're great. Uh, I'll be the one doing all the breathing here. Um, <laughs> is there – so when you're doing ADR and uh-huh. like I'm assuming – so th- you said the directors are there sometimes, sometimes they're not. Is that the same thing for ADR and Foley? Or they usually uh, for ADR? No, usually ADR, it's super specific, and the actor's in here, and there's usually producers, and there's, you know, script supervisors, sometimes the writer, or, or casting directors, or whatever it may be, but there's a, for, for ADR, there's usually a lot of people in the room. Makes sense. Um, usually the, the talent will have assistants, and people handling them, and making sure that we're running through and getting stuff done, and then there's people... Um, making sure we're getting the right takes and getting what we need, and there's the director, and, and yeah, there's quite a bit more people most of the time for, for ADR sessions. That makes sense, because it's actual yeah. dialogue in the movie. And it's yeah, read, and then you're, and... you're dealing with some um, some star talent and that kind of stuff where there just needs to be more people yeah. to make sure things get done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> makes sense, makes sense. When you're doing, because I know you've also worked on like animated stuff as well. Sure. As far as like finished product, how close it is, are yeah. when it comes to animated stuff, is it usually farther on? The, like more stuff is done, or it seems like the trend lately is things are less and less done oh. for animated. <laughs> like, like you'll we get Coco, it. Coco a couple years ago. Um, I guess it was a couple years ago, and. Um, like sometimes the characters are just floating on screen because we're working to either like storyboards even sometimes or, really? or just like really, really rough animation. Um, 
So yeah, like animated movies are are almost kind of harder because you don't have the benefit of production. I bet sound in there. So anything to kind of go off or give you an idea of what you might want to get, you just like every sound has to be organically created, thought of, and decisions have to be made thousands of times a day sometimes about which sound's going to work or if that's the right prop or the right shoe or, or the surface or whatever. Sure. Um, so there's, there's, in a sense, sometimes more that has to go on for, for animated movies because you're, you're creating everything in that. Man, makes sense. If When you're doing an animated movie, do you approach it any differently as far as like what you use for surfaces? Or are you still give it like a it, real base yeah it depends on like if we're doing something like angry birds where stuff's supposed to be over the top and funny and and humorous we might go like for feet like something um like for, say say for angry birds we might do like a, a rubber glove for the feet and whereas something uh-huh. like say lion King, when we're doing a bird there we might go more claw and more harder because it's more of a realistic versus a cartoony or or something like that so it really just kind of depends on, on the show, but yeah, we definitely have to do stuff more, where if we're working on a live action, we see a guy in, in tap sh- well, that's what we're going to get, because it's a more of a literal translation of, of what we're seeing. Sure. What's the most commonly used shoe that you oh, use? Oh, <laughs> No, I don't know if there's a commonly used shoe, but the, the most common sound is something not tappy and something with weight. So you want to hear um, something like if if... Chris Pratt's walking across the screen as Star Lord. Yes. You want to hear his presence. You want to hear his his superhero ness uh, in his footsteps. So you want to get something that's going to be deep. You want to get something that's going to maybe be kind of resonant as as a surface. So you can kind of hear the boom. And so he sounds masculine. So he sounds muscular. Right. As, or or Captain Marvel, like she just has all this power. You want to hear that in her. So if you hear like this tap or this tickiness, if you're using like a shoe, like a Converse shoe that's just rubber on the bottom, it's got nothing to it. When you're running on a spaceship floor, you're just going to hear all this high-end tappy stuff, and you're not going to believe that she would be wearing that or something like that. So um, when you have something that's high and tappy and you turn that down, you lose all the bottom end, so you're just left with what sounds like ticks or something um, oh. in your sound. But if you have like this low, kind of rounded, uh, weighty thing, all of that um, – all that energy lives in all of that, so you can turn it up and down, and you're still going to hear some of the detail, and it's still going to sound like a footfall. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. What? So how often do you use, like, the sound you're recording as is, and how often do you doctor it? Uh, honestly, I'm doctoring everything that we record. I have really? some outboard gear where I've got reverb units, and I've got processors and compressors and that kind of stuff. So I'm doctoring as I go. And oh, sweet. Uh, trying to add a, a verb or like a room to match what I see or match what I can hear on the dialogue as it's recorded just so that it sits in better and doesn't sound like it's right up in your face when we play it back for like the client or our sound supervisors. If you add a little verb, a little space, a little depth, you can press a little bit to get some of those transients down a little so they're not super ticky or, or high-endy and then you shape with some EQ or... Even as far as like effects, if we're doing like the sound of Green Lantern flying around and he's got his green aura thing around him, we do different stuff like that where um, it gets more into like the Foley effects or the the um, uh, more sound design type of, of thing more than just kind of straight traditional like footsteps, cloth, hand touches and, and that kind of stuff. So there's a whole whole spectrum of stuff and um, I'm never not having a reverb or some sort of EQ on it as I'm recording. Sure. Um, that's that's kind of specific to me and maybe a few others. And there's, there's some that just want as recorded uh, on on the stage. And, uh, yeah, so there's a few different ways to do things. And I don't think any one way is right. It's just, you know, this, the style and the, the, the flavor preference, I guess, of the, the mixer or the team. Sure. Has there been any, like, when you're looking for a sound effect, you went to, like, unconventional methods to be like, oh, that's weird. We kind of kicked a spring in this way, and that made that, like, any cool... Yeah, I think, I think Foley in general is just kind of unconventional. Like, footsteps are going to be footsteps, but, you know, to get other stuff, like, if you punch a dude in the face in real life, and eh, Yeah. Like <laughs> but, you know, in, in Foley and in, in films, we're, like, we're slapping stakes on the ground and doing boxing gloves on cement with grit to get like a scrape and you're doing these oh. low end drum sweeteners or whatever it could be uh because that's what we kind of want to hear sure you know? 
So it's, it is steaks? Is that what's happening? That's some of the time you're slapping meat or breaking cabbage or doing whatever. Um, that's cool. But I'd say even for foot, yeah, even for footsteps, like there'd be so many times where I'm I'm just walking down the street and I can't hear my own footsteps. But like the amount of uh, the size and weight we put on something like these superheroes, like it's just completely unnatural yeah just but that's just what wait. we kind of want to hear because we want to hear that and i'm a, a bigger guy and uh bigger than some of these superheroes but um <laughs> i would say everything's kind of unconventional like yeah we're walking people in shoes but they're not really we're never doing stuff how it really sounds in real life because we're we're hyper hyper hyperlizing hyper stylizing i like stylizing both of those things. <laughs> Any of those words, we're doing them. <laughs> yeah. So when you when you get the the footage from the movie, is there any sound to it? And you just yeah. Take so it we're out? no. Well, uh, what we get is we get what are called guide tracks. So we'll have a dialogue guide track of like the the up until then cut dialogue and what they're using. That's usually kind of leveled out. We'll have a, a temp effects track, which is either the in progress. Oops, I just hit my mic thing. The in progress. Um, sound effects that like the designer and the sound effects guys are working on mm-hmm. or it's just what the the picture editor put in as he's cutting the film together or a mixture of those and then we'll have temp music to kind of get a tone of what's of what's going on so we have those three things and i have those on faders where i can bring them up and down to check with what oh, that's cool doing so you know ideally where those music cues are and those sound effects are is kind of what they're going for so we can kind of lean and hopefully trust it that at least the tone and the emotion of what is in those tracks is what we're trying to go up against and match and play with. Sure. Man, so now that you know how the sausage is made for so long, can you still uh-huh. enjoy movies to the same degree? Dude, yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> I can uh I can go into movie uh, most of the, what really gets me is ADR. If I I can spot bad ADR pretty easily and that'll Ooh, take me out. Nice. But I can get so um, sucked into a movie that I just have a good, like, I still love. It's probably my favorite thing to do uh, extracurricularly outside of being, you know, a dad and a, a husband. Sure. Uh, is just to go to the movies, check same. out, and just have a good. Same, same, same. Yeah. It's the best. You have kids? I do not. I'm married, though, so. Yeah. It's fun, right? It's the best, man. Especially when you, you find, some... like, your best friend. Oh. oh. You get to spend all the time with them. Yeah, it's, I agree. It's fun. Nothing better. And then you got kids in there, and that's a whole other thing. Yeah, I've got a nephew, and oh boy. Yeah. Godspeed to you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. for real, it, that's that's something I always wonder as well for people that get to see versions of the movie that aren't the full version. So you're seeing like wires and incomplete effects yeah. and stuff. But then there's that other side that's got to be really cool when you see the final product because you're like, oh wow. Okay, yeah. when I with, saw it, um, it was different. With, say, Ant-Man and Wasp. Like, yeah. that movie was so different from when we worked on it. You know, there was, I don't know how, how many reshoots. We came back, I think a total of eight extra days on that show, uh, just to fill in for new scenes or whatever. So by the time we actually saw it in the theater, there was, like, so many things that cut out or changed. And, yeah, it's still really fun because a lot of, especially with these big-budget movies, a lot of the VFX and stuff are not finished. So... A lot of time we have no idea like what we're actually making or what we're walking to uh, until we see it in the theater. And they're like, oh, if only I could have seen that right. when I was working on it. could have done X, Y, or Z. But, you know, it all, it all works out in the end. That's amazing. So on average, how long do you work on a project? Like, like say, um, say like Captain Marvel, right? So like how, yeah. how many days are you doing on that movie just in, what you're, in your section? We probably had about 20 days. To, to wow. walk fully for that. That's it? And it was a, I don't know, it was a nine, eight, eight or nine real movie or something like that. Wow. Um, so, I mean, you know, with uh, back in the day, uh, which was even before my time, Foley involved, you had two Foley artists, you had a mixer, you had a recordist who was like an assistant to the mixer, mm-hmm. you had a projectionist who was doing the projection-y thingies, and then you might have had like a Foley assistant or something like that. So you go from like, you know, sometimes seven people and now this job a lot of times is just done with two. A lot of there's a lot of stages and a lot of shows uh, that are just a mixer and a walker um, or an artist. Uh, So I have a crew of three. It's my two artists and myself. Um, Love it. So, you know, you would think taking off like 
sometimes three people from a crew, you could then use that money to walk longer. But, you know, with technology, things are just getting cheaper and budgets are getting smaller. Um, and, and our days on the stage are getting smaller. Also, a lot of times we have a lot of good people in our in our corner who try to get us, uh, you know, 20 days on a show. But sometimes that's a luxury um, sure. for certain things. Uh, for Lion King, we had we had quite a few days. So it was nice. We didn't have to like jam through stuff. We could focus on on really crafting sounds. But then there's some where you got like 10 days to walk a whole the whole feature. And you're like, oh, my gosh, how am I going to do this? Um, I bet. So it's different, but you know, fifteen to twenty days is kind of the normal. Um, and if there's picture changes or something like that, they miraculously can find um, more money to let us have yeah. another day <laughs> to watch those things. Um, but yeah, no, it's uh, twenty days is a good amount. After that, you're like, I need to get out of the room and yeah. not <laughs> walk in these footsteps anymore. But yeah, it's it's a nice amount of time, and then after after that, you're on another show, and it just kind of wipes the slate clean, and then you're, you know, refreshed because you're on something different, and yeah. Sure. So you've got your team of three. Are there other teams at the ranch doing what you're doing? Is it like yeah. So um, teams are 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 somewhat fluid. Okay. And then minorly fluid here. There's a uh, my stage, which is the Jack Foley stage. There's the archive stage because it was in the old uh, archive building at the ranch, and there's three over there. And then there's the Fellini stage, which has a mixer and then uh, uh, a couple of walkers there sometimes too. So three kind of ish crews, or at least three stages. One's it goes from small, medium to large, um, and I'm in the middle sized stage. And uh, you know sometimes I'll work with the guys across the hall, or sometimes I'll work down at the archives building. Um, and then sometimes Ooh. the, the, the full artist will switch around and yeah, but right now I've had the same crew since November. Oh, that's uh, cool. Janice and, and Ronnie Brown. Uh, and I think we, we put out a pretty great product. I agree with that. Oh, thank you. That's right. So, <laughs> so you said that like you've got sound designers as well. So like you're doing fully, so you're doing the, the real life sounds, the feet, walking, the scratches, all these other things. So when there's, like, sound effects, that's somebody else. So, like, when you're doing animal noises and stuff like that. Yeah, the same, so if there's, it, if there's like, animal vocals, that'll right. be probably, like, the sound designers, you know, recording those animals and then doing whatever they do to them to, to fit whatever the picture's going to show. For animal movements, like, we'll do footsteps, we'll do fur, we'll do claws or wings and all that kind of stuff so we'll we'll take care of mostly everything that's non-vocalized for for creatures and animals and that kind of stuff oh cool uh, unless it's something big like godzilla where that that will use a time is better spent in a sound designer's uh stage than on foley uh just because they're going to have the time to craft and process and and do all that kind of stuff sometimes we'll do like a, a movement pass for them of like for um, How to Train Your Dragon, we did a pass of Toothless's footsteps, oh, cool. and then they were they were able to take that and then put it in a, some sort of program where they could then um, add a whole bunch. They basically used it as a map. So you get the performance of a Foley artist, and then you get the sound designer's design, and you mix them together, and you got a dragon. What? Yeah. That's so cool. And that's what you it's, do. It's, <laughs> yeah, it makes sounds for dragons. Uh, it's a big collaborative process. There, there isn't any one um, section in post-production audio that doesn't rely or, or n maybe not need help, but yeah, it doesn't rely on the others to kind of help everything. I love that. Yeah. Love that. So what, what equipment are you using? Like what programs are you editing on? What microphones are you using? Uh, we're using Pro Tools. It's kind of the industry standards. That's an avid thing, and yep. uh, we have a good uh, relationship with them. So we're always on the newest and bestest. Love and it. We got a great team, great IT and an engineering team here that's always helping us uh, with new things and and creating custom whatevers. Um, I use um, Sennheiser microphones. I got a shotgun mic that I like, and I got a like a, a pencil kind of larger diaphragm condenser. Sweet. mic that I use um, and I try to change it up every now and then because things get a little boring if I'm always using the same stuff sure I got some some nice mic pre's and then I got some you know lexicon 
verb units, I got uh, harmonizer, eventide things, and GML EQs, and tube tech compressors, and all kind. Of, I got pretty much anything at my disposal if I need it. And then, <laughs> I got it all. <laughs> and, uh, dude, when I got here, <laughs> no joke, my, my, uh, the head of production, or I think that's what he is, John Null, he's oh, like, yes. so what do you need? What do you need? And I was Ooh. like, well, let me just write it down. <laughs> and, and I'll let you know. And he's like, okay, we'll get it. Like, because these things are my tools, and he wants us to be successful. Right. Um, they were they they got me the things that I needed, and um, they're very gracious uh, about that. When we need props, or we need a different microphone, or we need a whatever, um, as long as we need it and we're going to use it, they're like, great, let's go get it. Have you thought about how amazing that sentence is? You said you gave John Noel right. a shopping list. <laughs> <laughs> No, like for real, like there'll be times where on the weekends our, our folios come back, which is like a, a car full of like, hey, we needed all these props for these things. And we're at the salvage yard and we got all this. And, you know, it's it's a, a real good environment. We've got a, a good uh, set of heads on the management here. And uh, they're all very supportive with um, with with making things work and with what we need. They treat us good here. Sure. And the final product shows that. Like if if, yeah. you, if you enable people to be the best that they can be, literally right. everyone wins. Right. Yeah. I'm so down. So down with that. So yeah. like, what is there? Is there a sound effect? Because you've you've worked on so many movies. My God. Yeah, I've worked on Would, a few. Uh, uh, yeah, I've worked on a few. I've been I've good. been blessed. I've got yeah. a, I've got a few favorites. I'm not gonna lie to you. Uh, but I'm wondering, is there an effect that you think of that like or a sound that was just took forever to get? Be like I just I don't know you know. There there's things that take forever to get in a bad way, and then there's things that take forever to get because you're you're being creative and it's big setups and and that kind of stuff. Um, listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Let me let me think. Yeah, because I think I'm at the point where I've worked on quite a few movies that sometimes I forget what I've worked on and what I've just seen sure. or what I've watched. So I'm like, did I actually work on that? Or it's just because so much time has passed since I worked on it or whatever. Um, the question was, <laughs> are things all... No. Um, okay, so for Ready Player One. Ooh, um, nice. Have you seen that one? Great have movie. Have you seen that one? Oh, yes. Uh, Anorak. Anorak? The, uh, no. Anorak's Robe. Yeah, the... the um, oh, gosh. The creator of the game... Or yes. the, the VR world, his in-game self. I think his name was Anorak or something like that. Yes. And he had this robe that was kind of like this this uh, flowy movie thing, moving fluid deal, but it was kind of like 8-bit chunky. Like It was like cubes that were kind of all reassembling and assembling themselves. Yep. Uh, and we were asked to do – so that's a little more designy. So that we were asked to do like a, a pass on that. Um you know, we were just trying to figure out how to get like the the size of those pieces moving oh, and be fluid and still make sound like cloth or sound like something. So we, uh, a foley artist, came up with this thing, doing some. It almost sounded like I. A lot of times, I don't watch what they do out there because uh, I'm focused on what I'm looking at uh, at my computer and my, my gear and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it sounded like if you took, you know, like those old oscillating fans that had those metal grills. Yes. Took that metal grill and then you took, say, I don't know, a screwdriver and you just kind of dragged it across the rungs yep. of that. And you like a, a ratchety tickety kind of thing. Well, we were able to take that. As she's performing with the the picture, and then with my processing live on my harmonizer, I, I had a program that kind of took that and flipped it and reversed it and repeated it, not quite arpeggiated it, but kinda. And so her performance with like my microphone in uh, pre, so I could bring down my direct signal of my microphone all the way and bring up just the affected sound. It came oh. like this really cool, like, like you know when you're going up on a roller coaster and you just hear the the track clicking under you because it's, I guess it's like, I don't know if it's a lock or a stop or something so you don't fall backwards if power went out or whatever. Oh, yeah. They're like, tick, 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 tick. Yep, it's like that, but 
uh, it was it was really cool. And um, when we get to do like sound design and stuff like that, we never know if like the sound designer is going to use it or if they're just going to use whatever. But I did hear it in the final, and that's that's really cool to see stuff that you know our team Made. created and designed. And they liked enough to use for for that. So that kind of took a while. We we're kind of racking our brains like how are we going to do that? And in the end, it it, it worked, and uh, it was it's satisfying to to hear that. I bet you made a sound. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not just like footsteps, because yeah, footsteps are or what I mean, they're very important for a thing. But absolutely, when you have to get a little creative than that, it's what really kind of sells the job for me. I love that. It's and it's like you said, it's it's creative, like in its truest form. You're like, let's do mm-hmm. this. Uh, and I also love that you've got that. Like, here's kind of what we need. It's like cloth, but not cloth. But I'll, figure it out, because that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> and sometimes that's all thread. we. It's all, yeah, they're like make it sound like magic or yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like what does like, that okay. even sound like? <laughs> <laughs> yep, I hear you. I feel like most of the best sets have that, and it again, it's just a testament to how much faith they have in you. It's like ah, and, and do it. You know what I mean? Like like George yeah. Lucas telling Dave Filoni like Darth Maul's alive. Figure it out. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's everywhere. And like how is that spoiler? At the end of Solo. Oh, my God. Dude, I think about it all the time. Yeah, I like, mean, come on. I need to see what? me a sequel for that dang movie. I know. Dude. Yeah. Dude. One day. Hey, you never know. I, I yeah, That's I'm, pretty I'm, much where I'm at now is, like, especially with, like, old EU stuff and whatever. I'm like, guys, just wait. You never know. Thrawn <laughs> was in Rebels. Like, anything is on the table now. Uh-huh. uh-huh. And once uh-huh. they see, once they see. Because, dude, can you imagine yeah. if we got, like, Darth Maul as like uh, the villain for the whole movie. What? Right? What? Well, like, how about that that Star Wars trailer, man? Oh, for Rise of Skywalker. Boy. And last. Dude, let's go in. Right? So that <laughs> that <laughs> moment of Ray backflipping over the Tie Fighter, I still like get goosebumps just thinking about it. Just that oh, yeah. sound. Like that's another one. The sound of the Force. It's sure. a specific sort of thing that you just know it like when Vader's choking Krennic in Rogue One like uh-huh. y- you know that kind of whoop, vacuum yep. sort of uh-huh. that, that's so cool yeah that's so cool and those guys that do the, the Star Warsy things are so good yeah Matt and Dave and the best Chris and all those guys dude and then there's people that also are you know Kylo picking up his lightsaber and right. doing other cool yeah. stuff yep dude I love it. Yep. I love it. So if you if you were to give someone advice who like wanted to do like foley mixing and foley art mm-hmm. and stuff like that to get into doing what you're doing, what mm-hmm. advice would you give them? Uh work in food service. Ah, good one. Good one, good like, one. Work work with the public, be a person that you can want that people want to be around you. Yeah. Have people skills. This whole this whole business is people skills, dude. Absolutely. If you can't work with the team, if you can't work with a supervisor, if you can't put your own ego aside to get what somebody else wants as their final product, uh, it's going to be hard probably to work anywhere. Yep. But uh, something that's so collaborative, you need you need the people skills. You have to be somebody that people can be around. <laughs> Absolutely. And you have, to, you have to have passion. You have to have the drive to want to do this. You can... I agree. Like, anybody can... Uh, maybe anybody, obviously anybody can't walk in front of a microphone, but if you don't have the passion to be a Foley artist to really get why you're doing something, uh, you, it's it's just not going to, it's not going to work out for you. I agree. Um, learn your craft. Just make sure that you uh, are always doing your best and surround your seat, surround yourself with people that are better than you at what you do. Never be the best in the room i guess sure because you stop growing uh, you're gonna stop growing you're gonna stop learning and then you're gonna uh, get a get an ego and a, and a and pride that goes with that that um that's not good for anyone yeah. <laughs> for real nobody wants to work with a jerk and people talk right. especially yeah. in an industry such as like the entertainment industry that's why yeah, it's a all, lot of people get brought in for the same things because yeah, they it's keep all working. about who you know and if people like working with you, if if you're really good at what you do, but no one can stand being around you, you're not going to get hired for that next job. Totally, totally. That's when it it's that much more important. Like, just be cool, yeah. man. You a know? lot of people can learn pro tools. They can learn microphones. They can learn gear and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's a big part of it. 
you have to you have to understand what you're doing but someone will teach somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing versus working with somebody that knows what they're doing who is just not pleasant a hundred percent that may be the best advice i've ever heard on anything <laughs> so well done <laughs> thank you yeah dude can you believe we've been talking for over an hour already cow i oh, cannot dude <laughs> this is super fun i had a yeah. great time yeah this is a great first podcast experience this what this is your first podcast i mean ever? this is the first where i've been in it sure yeah really i mean i've i've done a couple i had a my own studio in la where me and my my business partner kind of did uh, like commentaries oh, on movies. Sweet. We'd watch a movie and just do like director commentaries, but we were the director and we'd have somebody else in the industry with us. So we kind of, it was kind of like a mystery science theater 3000 thing. Love it. But with somebody who was focused on one part of the filmmaking that we all really liked. Uh, so we did a couple of those episodes and never did anything with them. But yeah, that's my first being on this kind of end of it. Dude, right on. Well, now I'm yeah. going to start the movement to bring that show back. Uh, right. That sounds awesome. <laughs> Dude, did you see that thing going around recently that was like Ben Affleck's uh, Armageddon commentary? Oh. Dude, he's like, he's clearly drunk while he's doing it. So the. <laughs> 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 this, this is whole, so it's great, is it's, what you're saying? Dude, it's amazing. He talked about how oh, he that's like. Funny. This is whole. This is like this three minute clip that's been going around that was like his him asking the director of Armageddon, be like, hey, so like it's easier to make oil drillers astronauts than to make astronauts oil drillers? I don't understand. And he's like, shut up, Ben. <laughs> and he's like, so that was the end of that conversation. <laughs> That's awesome. It was great. Oh, my God. So before I forget, uh, yeah. where can people find you online if they want to tell you how awesome oh, you are? Oh, goodness. Um, you know, they I quit can't. Facebook, which – So <laughs> let's find me on Twitter, um, the underscore B-A-C, I Love think it. is it, or Instagram uh, – under Zim Bleeder, oh, Z I M B L E E D E R, um, and then I started woodworking. So you can find me at uh, what the boardroom shop, I think, on Instagram, something like that. You started woodworking? That's awesome. Dude, what are you I making? I fell in. I fell in love with woodworking. Talk to me. Uh, <laughs> um, I started making. My my wife does the whole or likes the whole essential oils thing. Love it. So I, I started finding this kind of old, like, reclaimed wood and making some holders for those little bottles. Cool. Uh, and then I had a friend who wanted a picture frame. So I found some uh, – I found this guy who had this old uh, dunnage wood from, like, Japanese ships that used to transport and, and ship around railroad tracks or something like that. So it's, like, these super hard woods, like uh, mahogany and, and some oak and different things and – uh, started whittling those down and made a picture frame out of it, put some LED lights on the back and made this really nice thing. What? And then I just, and I, dude, I went to, I went to Galaxy's Edge last weekend. Oh my goodness. And I bought a lightsaber. What? Did the whole Savvy's workshop and built a custom lightsaber. Oh my god. And gosh. then when I got home, I just built a stand for it out of wood. Oh. Just like a little mount and it came with like this. this little pin button thing and I put that in it and it looked super dope. So I'm going to start making those and Dude. Uh, hopefully have a little side thing uh, with that. And then, you know, people, somebody asked me to make a, a stand for their guitar amp. So I'm working on that. And somebody here needs a, a cover for their, uh, for their radiant floor heating pipes oh, <laughs> in sweet. their house. Why like, not? It's been uncovered for 10 years. Do you want to make something for it? I'm like, yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, you know, I got a little wood shop in my garage and that's where you can find me after the kids go to bed. Dude, that's so cool. Yeah, it's it's fun, man. Just man. being able to create and uh, make something with your hands that's that's tactile, something you can hold and feel and, and use. It's they're, they're, It brings me a lot of joy. Yeah, look at you being a multifaceted person. Yeah, I'm like a man. <laughs> yeah, like a man. man. Stuff. Yeah, the, the sawdust. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, sawdust is no joke. That stuff gets everywhere. <laughs> You're actually 10% <laughs> sawdust now. So. I think so. I think I've got some sort of wood lung. Yep. That's thing. why you're so, that's why you're literally addicted to it. Yes. Because you started it, it got I, in your veins. I understand. I need it. I understand. Intravenously. I will help you with this addiction. <laughs> I am an enabler, so yes. we're going to connect, you know. Perfect. <laughs> but anyway, dude, this was awesome. Had a great time. Uh thank, yeah, thank you again. Thank you very much. Really yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for reaching it. out. Of course. And
Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it is at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites, as well as BrianBalance.com. That is balance with two L's. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. Let them know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. That's right. Just search the Interesting Podcast on Tee Public to get some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon. So if you'd like to support the show and get access to other exclusive shows, you can now do that at patreon.com slash JediBrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Logan, and Victor. Your support means everything, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.